Okay, if you would have been paying attention um, to what I was saying in the last video I made, yes, Neanderthals did coexist with humans, um, modern man, Homo sapiens. We clearly know that, and as I said, we have found little stone points inside Neanderthal skulls, which means we probably killed them off. A controversial uh, theory is that perhaps um, Caucasians, like I don't know about you, but like me, um, might have interbred with them because we share um, some traits with Neanderthal or similarities, but that might be because of evolution over time because, you know, we're both in cold climates. Our big noses and our brow ridges might be evidence of that. Now I'm going to quickly cover the term you use, microevolution. I'm using Wikipedia because it's free and uh, it's just a convenient source. Microevolution is the occurrence of small scale changes in allele frequencies in a population over a few generations, also known as change at or below the species level. These changes may be due to several processes, mutation, natural selection, gene flow, genetic drift, and non-random mating. Population genetics is the branch of biology that provides the mathematical structure for the study of the process of microevolution. Ec ecological genetics concerns itself with observing microevolution in the wild. Typically observable instances of evolution are examples of microevolution. For example, bacterial strains that have antibiotic re resistance. Microevolution can be contrasted with macroevolution which is the occurrence of large-scale changes in gene frequencies in a population over a geological time period consisting of extended microevolution. The difference is largely one of approach. Microevolution is reductionist, but macroevolution is holistic. Each approach offers different insights into the evolution process. Okay, and then it goes on to note that since the inception of the two terms, their meanings have been revised several times and even fallen into disfavor among scientists who prefer to speak of biological evolution as one process. The term was returned somewhat to prominence in the last 30 years due to breakthroughs in evolutionary theory that seem to indicate that there are different processes involved in speciation than simple modification. That was poorly worded. That was actually them, not just me screwing up. Surprise. Okay, this has led me into another subject which is that the children of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, would have had to have been having sex with their sisters. I mean, unless God created a bunch of other people and decided not to tell us about it. I mean, I, do, I, I mean, there's so much that isn't clearly, plainly stated. Like, after Cain slew Abel, he went off into Nimrod, which I've never been entirely sure what Nimrod is. Maybe you could enlighten me, since you seem to be a biblical scholar. Um, but anyways, there was... If we're all descended from two people, just two, I mean, it clearly states in the Bible that we're descended from two people, and it doesn't mention where these other people are that Cain goes and visits. But anyways, what I'm trying to get at is, there would have been a lot of inbreeding. And this inbreeding would have resulted in congenital defects, birth defects, retardation, I mean... Plus, we've traced mitochondrial DNA back to a figurative Eve that I really resent a lot of scientists for using that term because they gave you guys the idea that they meant there was actually only one woman. No, there was a group of women that they think everyone that left Africa and spawned the races that I'm not using politically correct terms here, but like Asians, 
um, Europeans, uh, even the Native Americans, Eskimos, all of them, all have the same genetic Eve, which is this group of female mitochondrial DNA. It's not like one physical woman, because in Africa you have various different types of female mitochondrial DNA, greater variation than all the outside races. So anyways, I, I'm just saying there's not support for an actual Adam and Eve in our DNA. Uh, okay, now it's time to review some Bible quotes, and this is just kind of a sick, twisted experiment of mine. I want to see um, what kind of excuses you're going to make for the following quotes. So, are you going to quibble about what evening and morning mean too, as well as day? I mean, enlighten me about the Hebrew of that one, okay? Plus, if this is the uh, inspired uh, work of God, why wouldn't he make it translate well? I mean, he's basically guiding the pens of the people who rewrite the Bible, right? Why wasn't it clearly stated so we all know? I mean, anybody can take apart something that's written vaguely and try to make it into whatever they want. I mean, look at Nostradamus. Do you believe in Nostradamus too? I'm just really curious because, you know, if you read into his text and you look in for symbolism and analogy, it, I mean, you can make it mean anything. Anyway, uh, to get back to the point, um, there's a lot of science out there and I think if you would read your Bible with as critical of an eye as you do for these scientific papers you claim to read, um, I, I think you really might find the evidence for evolution more compelling uh, than you want to admit. I mean, there are, you know, I cited a few examples, like that, that first one, the scrolling um, article. I mean, that clearly shows how it is possible for those two genes to combine and why we have less uh, genes, chromosomes, than uh, apes. So, you know, take it for what you will. I mean, it doesn't really matter to me, I mean, if you think evolution is true or not. I just don't like someone to think they're rational and reasonable human beings when the things that they're professing to believe rest solely, solely upon mythology upon irrational beliefs you're not doing reason any favors you're not furthering technology when you constantly reference a book that is clearly not based on fact but all other flying creeping things which have four feet shall be an abomination unto you Leviticus 11:23 Flying creeping things are obviously insects. I mean, and they couldn't even get the number of feet right. I think that that really points in the direct. Okay, do you know of anything with four feet that flies? That right there pokes a hole in the scientific validity of the Bible. So. Maybe you can cite an example, but I th think clearly if you look at the context of that statement, he was referring to insects, and they didn't even get the number of feet right. So, hey, you know what I mean? I Sometimes these conversations get so ridiculous, I don't even know how to deal with it, but I try. But, I mean, put a spin on that one, and tell me how I'm wrong because I'd, I'd like to hear it.